Dear colleagues, thanks for joining our discussion today and welcome to the meeting of our analytic philosophy circle. We are a group of researchers, mainly from the Ural Federal University, Yekaterinburg, Russia. Let me introduce the participants of today's meeting. First of all, those who are affiliated with the Euro Federal University uh, since our circle is based there. Uh, Ilya Gushin, Olga Kozareva, Victoria Sukhareva, and me, Lev Lamberov. Uh, also, we are joined by our friends Grigory Cherkasov and Veronika Buryan, both from the Moscow State University, and Anna Maiseva from the High School of Economics. A bit of history. Our analytic philosophy circle was formed in 2006, and we hardly try to meet every week. But of course, due to some extraordinary stuff, sometimes we simply cannot keep this tough schedule. Also, since uh, 2011, we organize an annual conference, you analytic on, and also we publish Analytica, the sole journal for analytic philosophy in Russia. Now, let, let's get back to the topic. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce our speaker, Ludovica Conti. Ludovica participated in our conference in 2022 20 uh, with a talk on arbitrary abstractionism and log logicality. And also this year with the talk on arbitrariness and abstract objects. Ludovica Conti is a research fellow at the Instituto Universitario di Studi Superiori University School for Advanced Studies of Pavia, Italy. Ludovica, grazie mille per esserti unito a noi oggi. So, Ludovica, please. Thanks. Thanks very much for this invitation. It's uh, an honor for me to be here. And uh, yes, I would like to uh, present an extended version of my talk at your conference, uh, Analyticon, this year. Um, this is a, a less known version of an abstractionist program. Uh, that is based on uh, an arbitrary reading of the abstractionist vocabulary. Uh, so, uh, in the first part, I will try to present abstractionist programs in general and particularly in the Phrygian tradition, um, because uh, abstractionist program had a long history, but I think that uh, some of the main um, current program um, are inspired uh, by Frege's uh, uh, log original logicism. And then I will focus on an arbitrary version of this uh, Fregean approach to um, abstraction. Um, and I, in the first part of the talk, I try to, to show that there are several advantages in the adoption of uh, an arbitrary account of an abstractionist program. Uh, in the second part of the talk, in the last part of the talk, um, anyway, I try to, to say that there are some problems and particularly these problems concern the metaphysical part of, the, um, of an, um, an, uh, a logicist account because I think that uh, an arbitrary interpretation of the abstractionist vocabulary is um, strongly compatible with the structuralist view of uh, uh, abstract object and particularly of uh, mathematical objects. Um, then, in, if there will be a time, um, I present also some uh, more details about the a possible semantics of this um, arbitrary uh, program. And um, I try also to suggest a possible way 
uh, to deal with a traditional problem of Phrygian original logices, namely the consistency of basic law five um, by the adoption of arbitrariness. Uh, very briefly, I think that an arbitrary interpretation allows us to identify a specific uh, restriction of basic law five that make this uh, that makes this um, uh, this principle consistent with uh, second order logic. So mm, this is a, a lateral result, but if uh, there will be uh, enough time, I think it could be a possible uh, topic to, to discuss. So uh, uh, to present abstractionist programs and particularly a Phrygian abstractionist programs, uh, program we can say that uh, uh, they are usually composed by a logical um, part, a logical theory that uh, can be a first order logic or uh, for our purposes, usually second order logic and one or more abstraction principles that are by conditional of this form. So for every A and B, the abstract of A is equal to the abstract of B if and only if A and B are in an equivalence relation R. Uh, this is an axiomatic presentation of an abstraction principle. Uh, we have also a schematic version of uh, abstraction principle, but for our purposes today, uh, namely um, uh, by the adoption of a full second order logic as a logical background of the theory, axiomatic and schematic version of this uh, kind of biconditional are equivalent. So I think that this uh, presentation is uh, uh, more uh, familiar for for this uh, kind of, um, of discussion. Uh, in the Phrygian, what I try to call Phrygian abstractionist program, um, it is useful to distinguish two main philosophical um, goal and project. The first one is an epistemological project uh, that whose aim is uh, to support uh, the thesis that we have an a priori knowledge of arithmetic. Um, the argument to support this uh, result uh, is based on an epistemological assumption, namely uh, the idea that we have a priori knowledge of logic, logic that in Phrygian terms um, should include also this uh, problematic basic law five. I, we, come back on this point uh, in the next slide. Um, so this epistemological assumption and another epistemological thesis, namely the idea that we have an a priori knowledge of Hume principle. Hume principle is uh, the main abstraction, abstraction principle that is adopted in this tradition. Abstraction, um, Hume principle says that the cardinal number of a concept A is equal to the cardinal number of a concept B if and only if A and B are equinumerous. Um, this is the, the main uh, abstraction principle that, that have been adopted in this tradition. And in order to support the epistemological thesis of an, an a priori knowledge of arithmetic, the first thesis that uh, logicists and the neologicist uh, uh, guys have to support is the thesis that we have an a priori knowledge of Hume principle. In a, um, uh, logicist Phrygian perspective, a priori knowledge of uh, Hume principle is a consequence um, of the fact that Hume principle is logical itself, because um, in the original Phrygian program, program we derive Hume principle from basic law five and second order logic. Um, anyway, we know that this uh, project failed, uh, because uh, Russell paradox um, arises in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this logical context. Uh, so in the neologicist tradition, a different, ar different arguments uh, have been uh, suggested in order to support the a prioricity of the principle. And the main one is based on the so-called traditional connection between a prioricity and analyticity. So in a neologicist uh, tradition, we have to support the idea that the uh, principle is analytical and uh, in order to be analytical, also non-arrogant and conser conservative on the um, second order logic and 
also probably we have to support other uh, positive features of this uh, this principle i will come back on any one of these points but i would like to um, give you a general framework and um, and the last point in order to support the a priori knowledge of arithmetic is the foundational thesis that characterizes respectively uh, logicism and neologicist account, uh, particularly in the um, logicist case, the idea that we can derive arithmetic, so second order piano arithmetic from second order logic and basic law five, this project failed, and in neologicist perspective, a result that is known as Frege's theorem. The idea that we can not derive a Hume principle, but we can add the Hume principle as an analytical, uh, non logical, but analytical principle to second order logic, and from second order logic and Hume principle derive uh, second order piano arithmetic. On the other side, we have a metaphysical part of the project, the project that um, we can call Fregean Platonism because I think it is a specific version of Platonism in the philosophy of mathematics. Um, I think that uh, we can identify at least three theses that characterize this uh, project. The first one is uh, a truth value realism. Um, so following Crispy and Wright, the idea that whenever a statement has a clear sense, that statement must be Innately true or false. Um, then a kind of mathematical Platonism, um, the idea that uh, there is an autonomous world of abstract object, so it is a kind of abstract object realism. There, there is an autonomous world of abstract objects uh, that are mind independent, lo not located in space and time, and not casual causally related with us, uh, and the idea that logical and mathematical objects are part of this abstract real. But there is also a third and more specific thesis that characterizes this Freudian version of mathematical Platonism, and it is the, the, the thesis that our, it originally has the uh, Freudian answer to the empiricist challenge about the intelligibility of the abstract realm. And I think that the Phrygian answer that is also uh, endorsed by neologicists in general is that our access uh, to the abstract realm and law is mediated by language. Um, this idea is expressed by Frege in the famous context principle that says that um, we um, not to, to look for the meaning of uh, a word in isolation, but in the context of the proposition. And in uh, another principle uh, of neologicist uh, program, that is the so-called syntactic priority thesis. Uh, we will explore uh, more in details this, but the idea is that um, metaphysics uh, mirrors the, in this case, the metaphysics of arithmetic mirrors uh, the syntactical structure of the language. So uh, in the Phrygian Platonism, in the perspective, we have an experience or priority of the syntactical categories on the metaphysical one. Uh, this is, I think, a, a part of the, um, the, the general uh, idea of the Phrygian Platonism, but this idea of in the, the way in which we can access to the abstract realm of uh, abstract objects is also the main argument that the Phrygian and neologicist uh, um, programs uh, provide in order to support Platonism in general. I think that uh, these three theses and particularly particular last one characterize a specific perspective on abstractionism that Wright himself called the robust abstractionism. But I think that uh, we can note that um, uh, the context and the syntactic uh, that are before um, the main argument to support in general mathematical Platonism in a 
framework um, is not really um, sufficient to support this uh, strong thesis because uh, synthetic priority thesis guarantees that we have an access to a realm of existent object but it is enabled to explicitly characterize them as abstract in a platonist meaning namely has fully characterized it not located in space and time are independent and causally unrelated objects so my idea my project today uh, is to disentangle a further assumption of argument that are implicit in the Phrygian, neo Phrygian discussion to support Platonism and to explore also alternative paths that are opened by diffusing these lateral but necessary other assumptions. So the idea is to explore possible non-Platonist Phrygian abstractionist project. Uh, I would like to, to show that uh, at least uh, one of these uh, non-Platonist Phrygian abstractionist project is able to preserve um, the epistemological side of the logicist project, uh, to partially preserve the Phrygian metaphysics, and particularly it is able to preserve truth value realism and a, linguist, a, a linguistic access to the ontology, uh, but is compatible, so um, probably in a um, problematic way, it is compatible with the structuralist account of the abstract realm. Uh, so, more in, in details, I think that uh, robust abstractionism uh, that I described it before uh, include these uh, three or four uh, further assumptions. The first one I have already mentioned is the syntactic priority thesis, that, namely the idea that the context uh, syntax ensure referentiality of singular terms to objects. But the idea is that if you uh, read um, a syntactic priority thesis, syntactic priority thesis in its term uh, presupposes a uniform and at face value reading of the arithmetical vocabulary. So the first um, uh, further assumption is this uniform at face value reading of the arithmetical vocabulary. The second one is uh, um, not explicit in the um, crisping right words, but is the idea of a canonical account of reference, namely the, the idea that we have a uniform interpretation of all the expression of the same synthetical category by means of what we will call a canonical interpretation function. And the last one is uh, uh, the assumption of a genuine semantics, namely uh, the assumption that semantics directly mirrors reality. Um, I will uh, come back on this point in the last part of the talk, so I can skip the, the quotation. Um, but the idea is that we have to assume that uh, uh, the language reflects the genuine aspect of the character of arithmetical reality. So I uh, briefly present uh, the possible direction of this non-standard version of uh, neologicism, so neologicism without Platonist, um, that are um, based on, the, uh, on the renouncing uh, to meta-theoretical assumption that I mentioned before, um, but that are able, at least some of, of, of these um, possible account are able to save uh, or maybe to enhance a uh, derivational result and the argument supporting the epistemological project about arithmetical a priori city. A priori city. Um, the first alternative, nominalist alternat alternative, is uh, um, what uh, um, Crispin Wright uh, called austere abstraction abstractionism uh, that we can obtain by renouncing to the uh, assumption that I mentioned before has to be, namely the at face value reading of the abstractionist vocabulary. Uh, in this way, we obtain an, an, a kind of abstractionism without Phrygian semantics and metaphysics. And a possible uh, um, 
example of this austere abstractionism is uh, Dammet's proposal of a kind of intolerant reductionism. A second uh, possible project uh, is uh, what I can call, I would like to call deflationist abstractionism that we will obtain uh, by renouncing the second further assumption I mentioned before, namely the canonical account of reference. In this uh, direction, we have an abstractionist program without only Phrygian semantics. I will uh, focus on this second option and I will uh, try to provide a possible example of this direction, um, suggesting a, an idea of an arbitrary logicism uh, that is precisely based by the renounce um, to the uh, Phrygian uh, account of reference. And I will show that uh, it is compatible uh, probably with a structuralist view on the abstract object. But I, in this uh, preliminary part, I would like also to mention um, a possible alternative, uh, namely redundant abstractionism that we can obtain by renouncing to the last further assumption that I mentioned before, namely the idea of a genuine semantics of these, uh, these programs. And in this case, we uh, obtain an abstractionist program without Freakian metaphysics, so without specifically Platonism, and I think that uh, a possible, mm, probably not the, the only one, but a possible example of this uh, direction is uh, a fictional account of abstractionism uh, that is... Um, uh, that can be classified as a kind of a fictional realism. So uh, I try to present this alternative and then focus on the second one, on the arbitrary logicism. Uh, regarding austere abstractionism, as I said before, we obtain this uh, perspective by renouncing to a value reading of the abstractionist vocabulary following this reading abstraction operator are ter forming operator or function symbol and uh, accordingly abstract terms uh, should be read as complex singular terms um, alternative to uh, an at face value reading uh, include possible paraphrases of the abstractionist vocabulary we have some uh, possible um, example in the literature uh, for example, a quantificational reading of the abstract terms has bound variables, or a possible Russellian reading of abstract term has indefinite expression, or in the um, most famous example, intolerant Dammet's intolerant reductionism, the abstraction principles are considered as explicitly defining their, um, their left hand side, so the um, identity statement in the uh, holophrastically, so in has in a whole, uh, has an, a structure at hold devoid of any syntactic pattern structure. Um, we, in order to support these uh, paraphrases of the um, uh, abstractionist vocabulary, we have to, su to support the idea that uh, abstractionist vocabulary has a misleading grammatical form that precludes the sharement of any genuine semantical structure and commits us to denying that there are abstract objects. So I think that um, this option is compatible with an strong strongly uh, nominalist renounce uh, to arithmetical realm um, so i think it is a, a very um, very strong uh, alternative to the Phrygian account because commit us to renounce uh, to the um, metaphysical part of the project but also to the epistemological part I am more interested in this uh, second direction because, uh, as I uh, anticipated, um, I think that this direction allows us to preserve uh, most of the Freakian account. 
Um, so uh, I would like to specify what I mean um, with the canonical account of reference. As a canonical account of reference, I mean a uniform reading of all the expression of a same syntactical category. So um, this presupposes that, that we have a unique notion of reference for expression explicitly and implicitly defined. And if you preserve the last assumption of a genuine semantics, uh, this account of reference um, provide uh, the, the idea of a unique notion of object. Uh, and the second part of a canonical account of reference is uh, what we usually call a canonical interpretation function, namely an interpretation function whose values are singular, determinate, and knowable items of the domain. And again, if you are preserving a genuine semantics, this uh, assumption uh, provides the idea of a specific Platonist notion of object. So uh, the reason why I think we can be interested in modify uh, the canonical account of reference is that um, this meta-theoretical assumption concerning reference already include the Platonist thesis that they should support. Uh, so by renouncing to a, a canonical account, uh, means uh, that uh, we have to renounce to a uniform interpretation and to a canonical interpretation function. In a purely negative uh, uh, terms, what we obtain is a deflationist reading of the abstraction principle, uh, following which abstraction principles are silent about the particular function that they select, uh, among all those that are able to map equivalent concept in a same object and non-equivalent concept in different objects. Abstraction function only have to index to index classes of the arguments by object of the codomain, and in this way they only impose a lower bound on the cardinality of the first order domain, but are neutral in respect to the identity of their values. And accordingly, abstract terms should only denote possible indexes of equivalent classes, so they are indifferent to their specific nature. Um, the idea is that this uh, deflation is reading that in the abstractionist literature has been introduced, I think, in a paper of 2010 by Antonelli, um, is uh, sufficient to achieve the mathematical result of, of uh, Freudian project because uh, it is sufficient to derive Frege's theorem, um, but provide a negative characterization of the abstraction from a semantical point of view. And for precisely for this reason, it is unable to support the philosophical part of the project, namely to exclude or to support the epistemological and the metaphysical logicist or neologicist project. Uh, particularly it is unable to determine the epistemological status of the abstraction principle and it is unable to determine uh, the object real, realism. Uh, so I would like to provide a positive characterization, a possible positive characterization of a deflationist account. So by introducing a semantical distinction between meaning of abstract and non-abstract expression of a same syntactical category and also specify a particular non-canonical interpretation function of the abstractionist vocabulary. And this particular interpretation will be an arbitrary interpretation. In order to introduce this uh, perspective, I think that we can... Um, consider the main example of a similar attempt and uh, then um, uh, emphasize the difference uh, between uh, this example, Dammit's proposal, and my suggested uh, account. Uh, in Dammit's proposal, we have to distinguish a realist reference uh, of proper name, that is the relation that an expression bears to the object it stands for, and thin reference uh, of incomplete expression, that is their semantical role, namely the contribution that an expression affects to the, 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 the determination of the truth condition of the sentences in which it occurs. And so in the Dammit's proposal, uh, the we are, the Dammit's account is based on a syntactical distinction between 
complete and incomplete expression and also um, on an alternative between realistic and thin notion of reference. Um, on the contrary, I would like to modify this um, these ideas and I would like to suggest uh, that we have to consider a distinction, not a syntactical distinction, but a distinction between a base vocabulary and implicit definienda of this project. Base vocabulary, so expression um, of the base language without abstraction, uh, so possible non-logical constants or explicitly defined terms. And on the other side, implicit definienda, because probably I am uh, forgot to, to say that uh, the biconditional that are uh, the dimension as a principle are also a, um, a kind of implicit definition of the abstract terms that they introduce. So the idea for me is uh, to emphasize uh, this of implicit definition of um, abstraction principle and so distinguishing distinguish the the semantic the semantics of uh, base language and the semantics of implicit definition uh, i think that uh, this kind of distinction uh, is uh, analog to the distinction between observational and theoretical vocabulary of science um, in which the meaning of the theoretical expression, so the primitive terms, is, is fixed by the axiom themselves and exhibit a, character, a characteristic indeterminacy. Um, that is also a characteristic feature of ab abstract vocabulary. Uh, so in this case, uh, arithmetical vocabulary is composed by primitive expression implicitly defined by for example, uh, Hume principle, whose meaning contextually depends on the theory axiom. Uh, I know that uh, this uh, comparison between uh, uh, axiomatic uh, um, theory of science and um, abstractionist theory presupposes a unitary account of uh, implicit definition, but I think that uh, in order to um, uh, discuss the semantics of implicit definienda, this uh, unitary account uh, could be supported. Uh, if, you, if you want, then we can also discuss this. Uh, this uh, so I think that there is this analogy, but I think that uh, um, this idea to distinguish the semantics of base language and of implicit definition, uh, implicit definition is also... Uh, because it uh, um, emphasizes theoretically the idea of a theoretical access to the ontology that is uh, compatible, uh, deeply compatible with uh, the neologicist syntactic priority thesis. So, following the syntactic priority thesis, objects are what singular terms into true statements stand. And, for. and we are adding the idea that which object singular terms stand for accordingly with their semantic role, so in order to determine the truth condition of the sentences in which they occur, could be pre-theoretically fixed in case of base language, but only depends on their semantic role in case of expression implicitly defined by axiom. Um, so this is the first difference uh, between this proposal and Dammet's proposal. The second one uh, concern the relation between uh, um, uh, between the realist reference and uh, semantic role. Uh, in the account I'm, I am proposing, semantic role is not alternative to realistic reference because it exhibits a necessary feature of meaning in general and contributes to fixed reference of the vocabulary when it is not provided in the meta theory. So precisely following the semantic role, the reference of abstract singular terms uh, is any element of the domain that is able to make true the statement in which they occur. So we know that arithmetical sentences are verified by any object of the domain appropriately related to the concept uh, in order to satisfy the abstraction principle. And this means that uh, any element of the domain that uh, satisfies this condition is uh, part of the semantical role and of the, um, of the denotation of the abstract terms. 
Uh, so we obtain in this way a theoretical thin notion of reference that is weaker than the pre-theoretical notion of canonical uh, realistic reference, usually ascribed to the singular terms of base language, because unable to select singular determinant and knowable items of the domain. Uh, this notion of reference is uh, compatible with the realist reference because it is part of this reference without the full identification that it usually includes. And it is possibly formalized as a kind of arbitrary reference. So concerning arbitrariness uh, in the literature, there are uh, different meaning of uh, arbitrariness. Uh, the first one is uh, a metaphysical uh, meaning of arbitrariness, following which singular terms, the not singular, knowable, no standard object, uh, namely objects that are undetermined in respect to some predication. And accordingly, uh, function symbol denotes a singular knowable set of ordered pairs whose second element is a no standard object. Uh, this is a, a strong alternative to um, platonistic account. Uh, I um, I don't follow this direction of arbitrariness because it is precisely a metaphysical account of the object. I am, uh, on the contrary, I am following a semantical perspective, so I will focus on uh, other two, in particular the last one, other two meanings uh, that are semantical meanings of arbitrariness. Uh, anyway, in the discussion, we can also compare the, this different account of uh, arbitrariness. So we have other two uh, semantical notion of arbitrariness uh, that uh, we can uh, call quantificational arbitrariness and epistemic arbitrariness. Uh, following uh, quantificational arbitrariness that is uh, uh, presented for example, by Jack Woods, uh, singular terms denote a range of a knowable standard object. So they denote a set of candidate denotation uh, for, uh, for the terms, uh, candidate denotation in the perspective of a canonical interpretation. And accordingly, function symbol denote a range of knowable set of ordered pairs in which the same, argument, uh, the same arguments are paired with different candidate denotation of their values. And another kind of uh, semantical um, arbitrariness um, that I uh, will adopt in, uh, in the following part of this uh, presentation is uh, um, usually called an epistemic arbitrariness following which singular terms denote singular standard object, but we are not able to identify this uh, object among the range of candidate denotation. So in this case, function symbol denote a singular set of ordered pairs whose second element we are unable to distinguish into a range of equivalent, of equivalent items. Uh, very briefly, um, a possible semantics in this, um, in order to formalize this uh, uh, epistemic idea of arbitrariness, um, can be obtained by, um, uh, by an application of a Carnap strategy uh, that, is, um, usually, that is usually adopted in order to formalize the semantics of uh, um, uh, the logic of science, so the um, uh, scientific theories. Um, I briefly mentioned this idea here, then if you are interested in the details, I can uh, come back on this specific point. Uh, um, so the strategy, the strategy is uh, providing a translation of the abstractionist language in a choice language. So uh, the, the, the goal of this part is to avoid um, the uh, abstraction, uh, the abstractionist vocabulary, and in this, and then, and then to introduce them uh, again by explicit definition. So the first part is a ramification of the abstractionist theory, and then. Um, 
an explicit definition, we have to uh, provide an explicit definition of the abstractionist vocabulary. Uh, in this way, we can uh, provide a translation of all the sentences of our uh, starting theory, and then we can give an evaluation of the uh, choice translation in a choice functional semantics and um, probably uh, build a choice functional model uh, for the choice translation of the abstractionist theory. Um, the, the point I would like to stress, at least in, in this moment, is that we are unable to provide a direct translation of the uh, abstraction operator in the choice operator. Uh, we need uh, this uh, different detour in which we provide an explicit definition of the abstractionist term uh, in terms of more um, longer and also complicated the terms that are expressed by a choice operator. So the idea that with the choice operator you are able to select uh, one of a range of candidate denotation that are able to satisfy the axiom of the theory. So uh, I hope this uh, presentation is uh, sufficient at least to have a general idea of the, the project. Now I would like to uh, focus on the possible advantages of these arbitrary accounts. So I uh, would like to explore uh, if um, if this uh, account of arbitrary um, of arbitrary abstraction uh, support the a prioricity of arithmetic and so following uh, a neologicist strategy the a prioricity of Hume principle um, as i mentioned at the very, very beginning of the, the talk uh, in the neologicist strategy we support a prioricity of Hume principle um, showing that this principle is analytical nor arrogance uh, that it is uh, impredicative but in an epistemical safe way and also that it, it is conservative um, and uh, in, in the very last part of this, um, this analysis, I would like also to focus on uh, what we can call a more originally logic strategy, namely the idea that we can su support the apriorisity of the principle by the logicality of the principle itself. Concerning analyticity, uh, in, the, in this debate there are, I think, at least three different definitions of analyticity. A definitional meaning of analyticity following which um, analytical is, uh, um, is a definition, an implicit definition that is determinative of a sortal concept. This is the weaker notion of analyticity and it is provided uh, by Bobeil and Crispy Wright in the neologicist tradition. A second meaning of analyticity is an epistemic meaning and it means uh, to be a purely stipulative truth uh, such that grasping its meaning is sufficient to justify our belief in its truth. But there is also a stronger meaning, a metaphysical meaning of analyticity, following which to be analytical means to be only in virtue of its meaning, so regardless of how things are in the world. And I think uh, that we can further spell out this point, saying that uh, um, uh, to be true in virtue of this meaning, regardless of how many things exist and of which things precisely exist. Uh, I introduced this uh, uh, taxonomy because uh, we can easily uh, test uh, canonical and arbitrary version of for example, Hume principle, and we can note that the Hume principle, both in a canonical and in an arbitrary interpretation, satisfy the definitional and the epistemic notion of analyticity, um, because it implies the existence of more than one object, uh, does not satisfy the third one, the metaphysical one. But... Um, more precisely, the canonical version of Hume principle um, does not satisfy 
the la very last point of analytical uh, analyticity uh, because a, a canonical account of Hume principle also specify specifically uh, which object are in the world, which object are the numbers as the notation of the abstract terms. On the contrary, arbitrary Hume principle at least satisfy this part of the metaphysical view. So. Uh, it is a bit more analytical than the canonical one. Concerning non-arrogance, um, the requirement of non-arrogance is uh, defined in the neologist's tradition as a stipulation without collateral epistemic presupposition. Um, so, Again, I think we can distinguish uh, two uh, possible presuppositions. The first one and the most known one is the existence of number. And this is the reason why the, 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 the argument uh, by which neologists uh, say that uh, piano axioms are arrogant because uh, their truth presupposes the existence of number. Um, and on the contrary, Hume principle is not arrogant because uh, as a biconditional, uh, it only states necessary sufficient condition for the, for the identity of the abstract terms. Uh, and so the left-hand side of the Hume principle entails that number exists only in conjunction with the additional premise that there are equinumerous concepts. But there is also another notion of uh, non-arrogance that has been recently suggested in a paper of uh, Bocconi Sereni uh, that concerns the presupposition of an, an, an identification of non-abstract object. Uh, we will come back on this point, but the idea is that in order to uh, prove that uh, the number of f, a cardinal number, is different um, from a, um, a non-abstract object, in the neologicist um, program, we have to uh, assume that uh, that non-abstract object, for example, in the literature, the case is uh, Julius Caesar, uh, falls under a sort of concept different from cardinal number. And so again, I think that uh, the stipulation of the Hume principle, uh, um, both in a canonical and in an arbitrary interpretation, uh, satisfied the first uh, notion of non-arrogance, uh, because both this principle does not presuppose the existence of number. But in an interpretation, in order to solve the so-called Caesar problem, they have to be arrogant, uh, neologists have to be arrogant in the second meaning of arrogance. Uh, on the contrary, in an arbitrary reading, we can dissolve Caesar problem uh, by avoiding the last presupposition. So also in this case, uh, an arbitrary version of the Hume principle is less arrogant than a canonical one. Um, another advantage uh, concerns the notion of impredicativity, uh, because a traditional objection uh, of Dammit to the abstractionist uh, debate is that abstraction, abstraction principles fail to be explanatory because they are circular, uh, namely because they, they, presupposes, uh, they presuppose the conceptual resources that they should explain. Um, this means that uh, abstraction principle fail as definition and uh, fails as uh, devices of new a priori knowledge. Uh, but the idea is that this objection presupposes that the range of first order quantification involves the set of the denotation of the abstract terms as object that uh, are not identified before the abstraction. And I think that in an arbitrary uh, perspective, uh, we have a clear answer to this objection because uh, arbitrary reference precisely allow a new identification of generic and previously identifiable members of the first order domain as they only has the object plane, the role ascribed to, uh, to the abstraction principle. So the, 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 um, the idea is that in an arbitrary perspective, um, uh, impredicativity uh, is not a problem for the uh, role of abstraction principle has implicit definition.
but we have some uh, some problem regarding the notion of conservativity in this uh, abstractionist debate um, there are two main uh, account of conservativity that are uh, considered uh, the first one is the notion of uh, weak conservativity uh, or uh, caesar neutral conservativity and our section principle is caesar neutral or weakly conservative if and only if uh, the theory uh, when it is uh, restricted to a specific predicate with the abstraction principle, um, uh, has as a consequence, for example, a property again restricted to the same predicate, only if uh, this uh, proposition C is a consequence of T itself. And a strong notion of conservativity, field conservativity, uh, that is the same, but where the predicate A is precisely the um, description of a non-abstract object. So the theory and the consequence are considered as restricted to non-abstract objects. And the problem for the arbitrary account I am suggesting is that canonical in principle is strongly conservative because uh, it has no consequence for the old ontology of any theory T to which it can be consistently added that are not already consequence of the theory itself. Uh, on the contrary, uh, arbitrary in principle is uh, neither strongly, neither weakly conservative because uh, uh, in principle has consequence for an undifferentiated ontology of any theory T um, that are not consequence of the theory itself. Uh, so, so far, um, we have seen that uh, arbitrary in principle is more analytical, less arrogant and semantically, but not epistemically or epistemically safely in predicative respect to in principle. Uh, but the problem, the possible problem is that uh, precisely the reason why arbitrary interpretation of in principle is more analytical, less arrogant, and uh, uh, epistemically safely in predicative, namely the idea that it can solve a Caesar problem without other presupposition, uh, make this uh, um, arbitrary version of a Hume principle not conservative. And this is a problem for um, the account because the general account, the Freguian account, because uh, um, uh, the non conservativity is also a um, able to defeat the idea of a strongly a priori feature of the principle itself. More precisely, we usually distinguish um, a weakly a priori notion of um, a, a, a weakly uh, version of a prioricity uh, that uh, means that the principle can be justifiably believed without uh, any empirical evidence. And this is satisfied also by an, um, an arbitrary version of a principle. But there is a, a strongly and more interesting notion of a prioricity uh, that means that it is weakly a priori, but also empirically indefeasible, uh, namely that no empirical evidence could ever count against the belief that uh, Hume principle. Uh, and so the problem is that given the non-conservativity, then we can not exclude empirical defeaters of the theory with Hume principle that aren't defeaters of the theory itself. So I think that uh, this... Uh, first strategy to support a prioricity of Hume principle, the um, uh, neologic strategy, namely to support by the traditional connection a prioricity by other features of the principle, is not, uh, is not very strong because, uh, okay, um, uh, arbitrary Hume principle is more analytical, is less arrogant, arrogant is uh, safely impredicative, but there is this problem concerning conservativity. Uh, anyway, I think that we have another strategy that is also more interesting for us because it is um, historical, the original strategy, the Freguian strategy to support a priority of the principle. And this strategy is uh, to show that the Hume principle is in a certain sense logical. And so a priority in, um, in this strategy is a consequence of the logicality of Hume principle. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, 
uh, with the timing i i have still some time because i i don't see you and i don't know how much time still i have for the presentation yes so you have about 20 25 maybe 30 minutes okay okay so uh I, I go on, then if you want, you can interrupt me in any, in any moment. Um, so, uh, regarding logicality, very, very briefly, uh, the, um, as mentioned at the beginning, uh, the Fregian system was composed by second order logic and basic law five. Basic law five in the Fregian project should be a logical action uh, from which we can derive as a logical theorem a Hume principle from which we derive second order piano axiom. And at the same time, um, basic law five should be an implicit definition of the extensional term that in turn are considered by Frege logical definizia of cardinal numbers. As is well known, this project failed because uh, Russell paradox uh, arises and uh, um, a fortiori Russell paradox proves that uh, Basil Glow 5 and its implicit definizia are not logical. Anyway, in the last century there have been different uh, um, proposal um, uh, in that whose aim is to, to save at least partially the Fregian project, neologicist, neologicism that I have uh, already made based on the Fregian theorem, namely the derivation of second order piano axiom from second order logic and Hume principle that is assumed as a non-logical axiom and other possible consistent revision of the Grungesetze uh, that are based on ways out of Russell paradox by um, the imposition of uh, uh, non-logical restriction on the main axiom of the theory, so on basic law 5, the comprehension axiom schema, and so on. In both cases, we derive second order piano axiom, uh, but the problem is that we obtain this derivational result uh, renouncing uh, to the philosophical goal of the um, uh, Fregian project, namely renouncing to the logicality of arithmetic. Uh, I think that uh, in this debate, uh, this topic has been uh, recently uh, discussed by um, adopting a more recent notion of logicality as topic neutrality. So following a Tarskian tradition, an abstract, ob an abstract expression is logical if and only if its extension is invariant under permutation of or isomorphism, and then we will uh, uh, make some differences. And um, particularly in the debate about abstraction principle, we usually distinguish logicality of the abstraction principle as uh, complete by conditional, the logicality of the abstraction relation on the right hand side of the principle, or the logicality of the abstraction function. So the denotation of, for example, the cardinal operator. In this debate, uh, the main criteria that have been proposed and discussed are um, contextual regarding the all abstraction principle, contextual the, the criterion of contextual invariance, following which an abstraction principle is contextual invariant if and only if for any abstraction function from the second order to the first order domain and for any permutation uh, of the first order domain, the permutation of the function satisfies the principle whenever the function does. This principle is implied by the invariance of the abstraction relation and we can also prove, I skip the details, that it is also equivalent and so reducible to the weaker form of invariance of the abstraction relation, so um, invariance of the right hand side of the principle. So I think we can focus on the last two um, subjects of invariance that are the relation and the abstraction function. Concerning the relation, uh, different criteria have been uh, uh, proposed and discussed in the literature, weak, double, simple, internal and double internal invariance. We will come back on some details of this um, criteria. Um, yeah, but uh, in this uh, introduction, what is interesting for us is that at least one of these criteria, double internal invariance, is able 
to select the logical abstraction relation, for example, equinumerosity, and given the equivalence mentioned before, it is able to select the logical abstraction principle. On the other side, uh, logicality of the abstraction function has been uh, uh, spelled out as objectual invariance. And this criterion says that an abstraction function is objectual invariant if and only if the function is invariant as a set theoretic candidate. So as a, a ordered um, as a set of ordered pair uh, composed by the argument and the values of the of the function. And the problem is that uh, uh, preserving a canonical account of uh, reference, this criterion fails for any function from the second order to the first order domain, in any case in which the domain contains at least two elements. And in, uh, in the paper of 2010 I mentioned before, Antonelli proved that if the relation is at least internally invariant, that is a, weaker, a weak form of invariance, uh, then the function is not objectual invariant. So uh, the result is that uh, concerning Hume principle, equinumerosity is a double internal invariant. So the principle, both in a canonical and in an arbitrary interpretation, is logical. But the problem is that uh, his implicit definienda, so um, cardinal number, are not logical themselves. Um, so uh, these um, elements compose, I think, uh, a dilemma for the semantic notion of logicality in uh, a canonical framework, because we have a logicality criterion for relation and then for definition. Um, so we have logical identity criteria concerning the abstraction relation and logical implicit definition concerning the whole abstraction principle, for example, Hume principle, but the same logicality criterion fails for their definienda. So fails, as we have said, for any function from the second order to the first order domain, but fails precisely in case of operator related to logical, uh, to logical relation and to logical abstraction principle. So uh, the dilemma is that operator fails to be logical just in case they are implicitly defined by means of logical relation and by logical definition. I think that this is a problem for a Freudian account precisely for the role of abstraction principle has implicit definition. And I would like to show that uh, the, so the main advantage of the adoption of an arbitrary account is also to uh, solve uh, this uh, dilemma concerning logicality. Uh, particularly, we can uh, spell out the same notion of uh, objectual invariance in uh, an arbitrary nuance. And in this way, we can prove that cardinal operator satisfy uh, the notion of uh, objectual invariance. Uh, so to be more precise, we can uh, mention, uh, we can call also this notion of uh, uh, invariance of the operator as objectual invariant, invariance, and I specify that is a kind of weak objectual invariant because it is uh, uh, precisely the same criterion that we call as uh, uh, weak invariance of the relation. So an equivalence relation is weakly invariant if and only if for any model a permutation of the domain, the permutation of the relation is identical to the relation. And in the very same uh, terms, an abstraction operator is weakly objectually invariant if and only if for any model and permutation of the domain, the permutation of the function is equal to the function. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, canonical interpretation of cardinal operator is not weakly objectual invariant, but has been proved in a, it has been proved in a paper of 2020 that given an arbitrary interpretation, uh, cardinal operator is weakly objectually invariant.
Uh, it is also interesting that uh, uh, given an arbitrary interpretation, we can also uh, rephrase the same criterion as uh, um, invariance not only under permutation, but on, uh, has uh, invariance under isomorphism. So uh, it has been proved that cardinal operator is in an arbitrary account isomorphism objectual invariant. So, um, these uh, elements provide, I think, um, already a local solution of the logicality dilemma for neologicism because cardinal operator uh, implicitly defined by means of the weakly or, or isomorphism invariant relation of equinumerosity is weakly or isomorphism objectual invariant itself. Uh, a possible objection to this, um, to this uh, positive presentation of this result is that uh, uh, the criterion I am discussing is anyway too weak uh, because it is um, very easy to satisfy this uh, criterion of uh, uh, weak objectual invariance. But I think that uh, it is not because uh, we can prove that uh, weak or isomorphism objectual invariance Invariance uh, presupposes weak invariance, weak or isomorphism invariance of the relation. And uh, this is a, a relevant point in distinguishing between second order and first order abstraction principle. For example, um, the uh, principle about direction, Fregian principle about direction, that say that direction of x is equal to the direction of y, if and only if x and y are parallel, is not. Um, weakly invariant uh, because the relation on the right hand side of the principle uh, is not invariant. So, no weakly objectual invariant fails for many first order abstraction operator because they are implicitly defined by means of partial abstraction relation that a fortiori are sensitive to the identity of the object in the domain and then are not weakly invariant. And we can also generalize this, uh, uh, this idea and prove a theorem that says that any first order abstraction operator is not weakly invariant. We have some two, a couple of exceptions that are not really interesting in an abstractionist debate uh, that, uh, that are an abstraction principle that, are, that has an identity on the right hand side or the, an abstraction principle with a generic relation, um, equivalence relation R on the right hand side. They are, I think these are not very relevant exceptions to this theorem in the context of um, of uh, an abstractionist program. But uh, uh, we can uh, uh, further uh, present the previous objection saying that uh, weak or isomorphism or jactual invariance is uh, reducible to weak isomorphism invariance. So, um, the, the core of the objection is, again, weakness of this criterion. But uh, I think we can prove that uh, this objection is wrong because uh, um, we cannot reduce a weak uh, objectual invariance of the operator to weak uh, or uh, isomorphism invariance of the relation. Particularly, we can prove that uh, um, the... This, uh, this implication failed because we can show that, for example, basic law 5, um, that is an inconsistent abstraction principle, is composed by coextensionality on the right hand side, where coextensionality uh, satisfies uh, the criterion of weak invariance for the relation, but the extensional operator uh, does not satisfy the corresponding criterion for abstraction operator, so weak objectual invariant. In the same uh, way, ordinal abstraction, that is the abstraction principle to introduce ordinal number, um, uh, is composed by uh, order isomorphism as equivalence relation on the right hand side that satisfy weak invariant for the relation, but the corresponding ordinal operator does not satisfy weak objectual invariance. So it is interesting because uh, uh, we are introducing by this notion of weak objectual invariance, so invariance in an arbitrary interpretation, also a precise distinction between consistent and inconsistent abstraction principle. 
But I think that there is also another interesting advantage of the adoption of this uh, arbitrary version of abstraction and in general of this arbitrary account of logicality. And uh, um, the, the advantage is that we can also uh, consider um, the revised form of uh, original Frege Grungesetze. Uh, particularly, I think this taxonomy uh, is not exhaustive, but I think it could be uh, exempli uh, exemplificative of a uh, possible way to uh, solve Russell paradox. Um, a possible way is by imposing a Boulosian restriction, so restricting the um, left to right direction of basic law 5, uh, imposing a predicative restriction on the comprehension axial schema, or um, weakening, so imposing a restriction of, on the uh, left to right direction of basic law 5 um, on the basis on, of some uh, logical changes, for example, by the adoption of uh, a free, lo free logic. And the idea is that in any case in which we are able to obtain a consistent revision of basic law 5, the extensional operator arbitrarily interpreted is uh, weakly or isomorphism objectual invariant. So um, the idea is that we uh, started from Hume principle, that is uh, the canonical abstraction principle for the neologicist uh, um, tradition, but we can also generalize to other abstraction operator this result, and, then, and it is really interesting for us that we can generalize this result to the extensional operator, that is the original Phrygian operator. The last possible objection uh, to this uh, direction is that um, this criterion is still too weak uh, because it is unable to distinguish among consistent second order or higher order operators. But I think that we can also reply to this objection um, proposing the analog criterion of the other criterion of invariance I mentioned before um, that have been so far proposed for the uh, abstraction uh, for the equivalence relation. So I skip the details for, for the time, but uh, the idea is that we can propose double objectual invariance, simple ob objectual invariance and internal objectual invariance that are the analogs of the same criteria that have been already discussed in the literature concerning the equivalence relation. And we can prove that cardinal operator is doubling simply and internally objectual invariance. Uh, we can pr prove that double objectual invariance presupposes double invariance, simple objectual invariance presupposes simple invariance of the relation, the, the second part, internal objectual invariance presupposes internal invariance of the relation. Um, so if these criteria for equivalence relation are enough to formalize the logicality of the equinumeral among the other second order relation corresponding arbitrary criteria formalize the logicality of the cardinal operator. So I think that in this way we are uh, able to provide a general solution of the logicality dilemma, uh, proving that cardinal number function in this arbitrary interpretation is logical. Uh, I don't know, I try to... Uh, give some idea concerning this part, that is the more metaphysical part, uh, if I have still five minutes, and uh, then maybe we can discuss and I can come back on the different point uh, as you prefer. Uh, so, the idea is that uh, concerning the epistemological part, this criterion of weak objectual invariance seems seem to be a useful criterion to carry out the Phrygian project. Uh, but we are now considering the aim of a logicist, of a logicist project uh, has the, uh, the possibility to do a substantial amount of mathematics in pure logic without abandoning the thought that numerical expressions are referential and without taking on additional commitments to problematic ontology. 
Uh, but arbitrary reference of definium, I would like to, to suggest, is not an armless alternative to the canonical one because it presupposes a non logicist view of implicit definition, particularly a reading of abstraction principle has a structural implicit definition of singular terms, and it, it is compatible with or even uh, suggests a structuralist metaphysics of the abstract objects. Very briefly, in the traditional debate, uh, there, are, uh, there are two kinds of uh, implicit definition um, are usually distinguished uh, objectual implicit definition, like Hume principle, has definition of the non-primitive vocabulary in terms of primitive one. Uh, in this case, we have a singular definiendum that is implicitly defined by singular axiom, uh, where given interpretation of all the terms in the definition are the tools to provide uh, the meaning of the definiendum. And in this kind of definition, uh, it is considered a goal of the definition to fix a unique reference for the definiendum. On the other side, in the debate is usually admitted another kind of implicit definition uh, usually called structural implicit definitions, such as axiomatic definitions, so for example, uh, piano axiom, where more definienda are reciprocally defined by means of multiple action, axioms, in which we haven't a prior semantic stipulation in general, so no prior semantic stipulation concerning definience or definiendum, and we allow that the reference of definiendum is indeterminate. So the success of the definition allows specification to be left indeterminate. Um, so in the traditional debate, uh, objectual and structural implicit definition are this joint group of definition whose respective success uh, consists in fixing a specific kind of reference uh, corresponding to the logicist and the structuralist expectation about definition. Uh, I think that uh, we can also support in this arbitrary direction an alternative taxonomy following which objectual implicit definition uh, constitute a proper subset of structural implicit definition. Uh, so, uh, objectual definition are structural implicit definition that are able to uniquely fix the reference of uninterpreted terms. And also among uh, these structural implicit definition, there are different traditions, a more Phrygian one following which structural implicit definition concern uh, directly structure or class of models, and another tradition following which structural uh, implicit definition specifically concern theoretical singular terms. And the idea is that uh, in, uh, in the presentation I, I gave uh, before, uh, we are not only uh, skipping from an objectual to a structural definition, but precisely following a, uh, Ilber an Ilbertian uh, idea of structural implicit definition. So has a structural implicit definition of singular terms. Uh, and this uh, parenthesis on definition is uh, useful, uh, I hope, in order to uh, reason about the metaphysical side of the logicist project. I briefly would like to suggest that an arbitrary account of abstraction is able to support logicality, as we have seen of the abstract object, uh, but also the thesis of a truth value realism and also the syntactic priority thesis still supporting an at face value reading of the abstractionist vocabulary but uh, it uh, suggests to renounce to the precisely the Phrygian uh, mathematical Platonism I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the talk, because uh, still preserving the assumption of a genuine semantics, so still preserving, uh, just preserving the idea that semantics mirrors the reality, um, this account of arbitrariness supports a structuralist thesis 
uh, probably a kind of object structuralism and it, it can be also compared with the option that I uh, that I uh, diffuses at the beginning, namely with the idea of a kind of metaphysical arbitrariness. Uh, very, very briefly, concerning truth value realism, namely the idea that every well-formed mathematical statement has a unique and objective truth values that is independent of of whether it can be known by us. Uh, this thesis presupposes the objectivity of mathematical facts. And I think given a canonical interpretation of the abstraction principle, truth value realism also presupposes a solution of uh, Caesar problem. Caesar problem, uh, I have mentioned uh, briefly before, is uh, the problem of the mixed identities. So uh, the problem that in a canonical account an abstraction principle is unable to provide the identity condition of the number of f is equal or not to Julius Caesar. Uh, on the contrary, given an arbitrary interpretation, truth value realism is also compatible with uh, Caesar problem dissolution. So I think that an arbitrary account is uh, a um, better point of view also to support this thesis of truth value realism. Uh, the idea that um, it is compatible with the Caesar problem dissolution is because we can consider a mixed identity statement in uh, um, analogy with uh, mathematical conjecture. Mathematical conjecture is determinately true or false, uh, even if no one is able to prove or to confute it and there is no guarantee that someone will be able to do. Uh, because we can consider, or in this debate we usually consider, a conjecture as an infinite conjunction of statement, each one of which is determinately true or false. And in a similar way, also in uh, a mixed identity statement is determinately true or false, even if, given the arbitrary denotation of the number of f, we are not able to fix such a truth values, because it can be read as an infinite disjunction of statement, each one of which is determinately true or false. So the idea is that uh, arbitrary interpretation does not affect the objectivity of the abstractionist statement and their truth value realism. I skip the details, but the idea is that uh, this account of arbitrary abstraction is also compatible with the syntactic priority thesis. Uh, but uh, we arrive to the, the problem, to the main concern. Uh, a semantical indeterminacy means that uh, from a semantical point of view, abstract objects are only characterized as index or indexes of equivalence classes that candidate denotation of the same abstract terms share their relation with candidate denotation of other terms. And uh, the invariance uh, under isomorphism, the criterion of logicality I uh, mentioned before presupposes that abstract objects are characterized only by their structural relation. So if we have this uh, semantical account of uh, um, arbitrariness and we preserve the assumption of a genuine semantics, uh, namely the idea that meanings reflect genuine aspect of the arithmetical reality, what we obtain is a kind of metaphysical incompleteness concerning the internal nature of the abstract object. So uh, given this uh, idea of a genuine semantics and given an arbitrary semantics, the number of x only is the index of the equivalence class of concept equinumerous to f. So the number of f is anything, any object in the domain able to play this role. And mathematical sentences are about such role or places as characterized by their structural relation. So the idea is that uh, this uh, uh, arbitrary account, uh, uh, this arbitrary semantical account is compatible with structuralism and also suggests structuralism uh, precisely in virtue of the genuine semantics that is uh, an original Phrygian assumption. 
And uh, now I can skip the details. I think that uh, um, a possible version of structuralism that is compatible with this arbitrary account is a relative structuralism, that is uh, kind of nominalism about abstract structure, but preserve a kind of realism about the object. And, but I think that um, I haven't developed so far um, uh, the, the connection between uh, uh, this account of arbitrariness, uh, semantical arbitrariness and metaphysical arbitrariness, that is a perspective introduced by Fine. But I think that we, if we have a, um, an arbitrary semantical account and a genuine semantics in the Phrygian notion, uh, we, prob we probably obtain something very similar to metaphysical arbitrariness. So I uh, skip the final details uh, with the uh, possible anti-realist consequences of this uh, account, because maybe it could be also less interesting for us. And I, I think I have to conclude here to, to leave space for uh, maybe discussion. Uh, so I introduce a kind of uh, robust abstractionism characterized by an epi epistemological project where we have an a priori knowledge arithmetic and metaphysical project, namely a Phrygian uh, mathematical platonism. And I would like to shift the focus on a non-standard account of uh, um, abstractionism that I called neologicist without Platonism. I mentioned the three possible opt options, austere abstractionism, deflationist abstractionism, and red red redundant abstractionism, and I focus specifically on the second one. I provide an example of this second direction with an arbitrary logicism um, that is characterized by semantical distinction between the kind of meanings of abstract and abstract expression of the same semantical category and an arbitrary interpretation function for the abstractionist vocabulary. Uh, regarding the epistemological project, I think that this account works very well uh, because it is able to support a priority of arithmetic by supporting the a priority of Hume principle because of its logicality. But from a metaphysical point of view, I think that this project is uh, uh, deeply uh, compatible with the structuralism uh, because, uh, okay, it is able to preserve truth value realism and the syntactic priority thesis, but it deflates object realism. So I think it is compatible with uh, structuralist view of abstraction. Uh, I think I can stop here. Uh, in order to leave uh, time, some time for maybe discussion. Okay, so thanks a lot, uh, Ludovica, and let's proceed to our Q and A session. Are there any questions? In fact, I'd like to ask some questions. And probably the first one is, how does structuralism arise in the proposed conception? Is it because of arbitrary interpretation of abstractionist vocabulary or because of something else? Yeah, thanks for the question because I, um, I, I didn't explain very, very well. The idea is, yes, I think that structuralism is a possible consequence of the arbitrary semantics. And the reason is uh, when you give an arbitrary interpretation of the abstractionist vocabulary, uh, what you are saying is that, uh, for example, your abstraction principle is the number of f is equal to the number of g if and only if f and g are equinumerous. The number of f in a canonical interpretation is a specific object. In an arbitrary interpretation, on the contrary, is any object that play a rule, the rule of index of equivalence classes. So the idea is that abstraction principle is the only uh, source of information for you about the abstract object. And this only source of information uh, says poor information 
the it characterizes abstract objects only by its role and i think that uh, if you read in this way um, an abstraction principle what you obtain is a structural characterization of the abstract object so as objects that are characterized not uh, by the internal essence internal nature as a Phrygian Platonist wanted, but it is characterized by a role and by the by its relation with the other abstract object. Because the only information that an abstraction principle in an arbitrary interpretation provides is that it, this object should be able to play the role of an index and precisely, it, it should be the index of the equivalence classes of all the concepts that are equinumerous or equivalent to the concept you are mentioning. So the abstract of F should be the index of all the equivalence classes of the concept equivalence to F. So you also know that it, it, it should be the same um of uh, the abstract of g if g is equivalent to f but it is it should be different from the abstract of i don't know uh b if b is not equivalent to f so what you are imposing by an arbitrary reading of an abstraction principle are relation between this kind of abstract object that does not concern the internal nature so in a model theoretic perspective, the idea is that you can, um, the intended model in the Fregian tradition should be a model in which in your first order domain, you have uh, non-abstract object, and then you have uh, specific uh, object uh, that are the numbers themselves. You have the number one in your domain, the number two, and so on. In this idea, uh, you can consider as a model of this theory any model in which you can also avoid the number has a specific object. You can have a model in which in your domain you have infinite chairs and you can use any chair as index of equivalence classes of concept. So it is independent to the... Uh, I don't know, internal nature of the the object themselves. I don't know if I answered. Yes, thank you. Uh, if I understood cor correctly, abstraction principles are the sole source of information about abstract objects in inflationary abstractionism, but in but in deflationary abstractionism, one can refer to the objects already even without abstraction principles, right? Yeah, yes, precisely. But the idea is that uh, inflationary or deflationary uh, reading are opposite reading of the same principle. So the idea is if you start uh, by the syntax of this principle, I think you haven't uh, motivation sufficient to have an inflationary uh, interpretation. Because in order to be... Uh, I don't know, to, to read this principle, this principle uh, is not able to provide all the information that an inflationary reading uh, wants. Okay, but uh, I still don't get uh, how deflationary abstractionism supports uh, structuralism. Okay. Because, uh, because uh, uh, if uh, abstraction principles are the sole source of information about abstract objects only according to inflationary uh, abstractionism, then uh, obviously structuralism is implied by uh, inflationary uh, abstractionism. But in case of deflationary abstractionism, I, I don't think that we have something like that. Okay, Th thanks for the, for the point. I think that uh, what you are um, calling inflationary include 
what in the talk I, I mentioned as genuine semantics. So the idea that semantics mirrors, I don't know, the real. And so the idea is that in a deflationary account, uh, you can also preserve this idea. So the idea is to distinguish a semantical level and the metaphysical one. If you are purely deflationist, as you are saying, so you are only uh, providing a semantical perspective, I agree with you. You are not able to support a, a metaphysical alternative. So, for example, a structuralist one. But if you are still preserving the idea that your semantics should be informative, on the metaphysics of your project, then I think that a, an arbitrary account that is an example uh, in which we can we formalize a deflationist reading uh, is compatible with the structuralist thesis for, for this reason, because, uh, for example, concerning cardinal number, uh, we can have two main options to define cardinal number. You can define cardinal number as a specific object, or you can define cardinal number as uh, an object in a structure, so an object that is in precisely relation with other objects. And so I think that if you have your abstraction principle and you renounce to identify the up to to consider the abstract terms as denoting specific object, so you renounce the first alternative, what you obtain, the information you obtain, um, allow you only to uh, consider what you are defined, so cardinal number, as a placeholder in a certain structure. I don't know if Okay, so uh, my point is is that um, so inflationary, arbitrary uh, abstractionism implies structuralism. So one has structuralism automatically, See. but deflationary, arbitrary abstractionism does not imply structuralism but it is compatible with it still okay uh, i would like to thank you a lot for this point because i'm not i wasn't precise on this point neither in the paper nor in the presentation you are distinguished if i understood your suggestion uh, inflationary arbitrary account and deflationary arbitrary account it is right so yeah probably yeah 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 no no thanks a lot because i i wasn't clear on this point and so i uh, didn't mention this uh, in, in a precise way these two uh, options uh, and uh, i think i i totally agree with you in um, if you are deflationary arbitrary uh, what you are proposing is something that is uh, at most compatible with structuralism. If you are, uh, if you support a more strongly perspective, so what you mentioned as inflationary arbitrary account, so you probably imply um, a structuralist thesis concerning metaphysics. Thanks. If, if this is the difference you are mentioning, thanks for the clarification. Otherwise, you can say me what, what I misunderstood. Yes, thank you so much. And also, uh, could you shed some light on the Hume's principle and its status in arbitrary abstractionism? Is it still analytic? Is it logical and so on? Briefly? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I think that um, Hume principle in uh, an arbitrary account, I mentioned in some slide, um, is more analytical uh, 
uh, then uh, in principle in the traditional, in the canonical account and is more analytical because uh, also in the stronger meaning, in the strongest meaning of uh, analyticity, that is uh, something true in virtue of its meaning, uh, regardless of, uh, of the world. Uh, we can spell out this regardless of the world as regardless of uh, uh, how many things are, are in the world and regardless of uh, which things are in the world. So I think that in a canonical account, uh, your principle fails both this, uh, this uh, requirement because in a canonical account, your principle says uh, how many things are in the world and says which things are in the world because uh, in a canonical account, your principle uh, uh, aims to identify specific object as cardinal number. In an um, arbitrary account, on the contrary, uh, arbi uh, an arbitrary version of your principle still says how many things are in the world. Because also in an arbitrary account, abstraction principle impose a lower bound on the cardinality of the domain. But um, arbitrary your principle does not uh, says, say uh, which objects are in the world for the reason I mentioned it before, because you can have a model with uh, tables, a model with infinite uh, chairs, a model with uh, other objects. It is not relevant for an arbitrary perspective. So I think it is uh, a bit more analytical than uh, canonical. Um, in principle. Um, I think that another advantage is that it is uh, less arrogant of uh, the canonical version of uh, in principle because, um, again, arrogance can be considered as uh, the presupposition and presupposition of existence or presupposition of uh, the identification of other objects. And again, a canonical version of your principle uh, does not presuppose the existence of number for the truth of biconditional, but presupposes, uh, presupposes the identification of non-abstract object as such. Uh, on the contrary, arbitrary uh, your principle is able to um, so it's, um, it's not arrogant because it does not presuppose existence because it is a biconditional, but uh, um, moreover, uh, it also does not presuppose the identification of non-abstract objects as such, because uh, for the reason I mentioned as Caesar problem, it is not relevant in an arbitrary account uh, that we are able to say is that uh, the number of f is equal or not to Julius Caesar. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I personally have some more questions, but probably someone else wants to ask. So, are there any questions? Olga Kozareva wrote me that she had to disconnect, but she has a question, probably, as she says, probably it's a trivial question. So um, the question is as follows. Platonism about abstract objects uh, was, in, in your presentation, was defined uh, as a conception which presupposes the following uh, points. Uh, abstract objects are not in space and time. They are causally inert and they are mind independent. So her question is, what if we uh, take only these two, two of these uh, points like uh, not in space and time and uh, causally inert 
and uh, if we throw away the last one that is mind independence so is it still a kind of platonism yeah yeah uh, it is really interesting because i never thought about uh, this uh, this idea um it is absolutely not trivial but uh, uh, complicated question uh, oh i think there are two problems the first one uh, is uh, if you preserve uh, not located in space and time and causally inerted and uh, we avoid mind independency what we obtain in general in metaphysics uh, this is a kind of platonism i don't know honestly i don't know i think not but it is a very naive answer i think not but because i think that the independency of the uh, of the abstract uh, is an essential feature of platonism but i am not an expert on different kind of uh, uh, platonist metaphysics so I'm not sure. But another point that I think could be interesting precisely in this framework uh, is uh, to investigate uh, what we obtain uh, because I, I mentioned different form of uh, neologicism without Platonism. And I mentioned only three kind of this uh, general direction. And the, the idea that your colleagues are suggesting uh, probably opens uh, another kind of uh, maybe neologicism without Platonism. So I have to reason about this uh, a bit more because now I, uh, I don't know, but it could be interesting to, to, to analyze this uh, this option has a further alternative to the standard account, to robust abstractionism. So thanks for the suggestion. It is, I think, not properly a question or, or I don't know what you think about. Uh, do you think that it could be considered as a, a kind of platonism still without independency? Well, I don't know. <laughs> so. okay. So she suggests uh, something like uh, Immanuel Kant's uh, conception with things in themselves and uh, phenomenon which are uh, dependent on our uh, on the constitution of, of our mind or something like that. Okay, okay. So there is a kind of objectivity that is preserved also even if. It is dependent on our construction of our mind. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are there any questions? I have a small question. First of all, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, I want you to uh, to clarify, uh, uh, you use this uh, two conservativity uh, principles, weak and uh, field, and uh, or Caesar neutral when you discuss this uh, Caesar problem. Can you clarify for me uh, what type of uh, principle uh, um, is used in uh, deflationist or inflationist uh, uh, logicism. Okay, Thank, thanks for the question. Uh, the idea is that um, in the um, in, in a canonical account, um, abstraction principle and uh, also Hume um principle that is uh, uh, one of the the main subject of our investigation. So in principle is the abstraction principle that says that the number of F is equal to the number of G if and only if F and G are equinumerous. Uh, this principle fails the standard notion of conservativity um, because um, when you had a, 
this kind of principle to a theory, um, you are able to provide consequences uh, that concern also the previous uh, uh, ontology um, that are not derivable, for example, by the theory. A simple, a, simp a toy example is a theory theory in uh, which you are not able to derive the cardinality of, uh, of your domain. And if you had an abstraction principle, for example, Hume principle to your theory, you are able to derive that you have uh, infinite object in your domains. So you have a statement that you can uh, give in your previous vocabulary and that concern also the previous ontology that you are unable to prove with the, um, the, the standard theory and that you uh, became able to prove with the, uh, adding abstraction, uh, abstraction principle, for example, Hume principle. Um, field conservativity or Caesar neutral conservativity are um, weaker form of conservativity uh, that are instead satisfied by, for example, Hume principle, if you have a canonical interpretation of Hume principle, because uh, they are satisfied because you uh, go and proceed by considering the theory and the consequence in the antecedent of your conditional statement of conservativity restricted to the uh, non-abstract object. So the idea is, yes, with abstraction principle, you are able to say something more, to derive something more, but your antecedent is restricted to the theory without abstraction. So you, the idea is, uh, uh, okay, you can say something more, but uh, um, you are able you are unable, sorry, to, to say something more without abstractionist vocabulary. It is quite trivial. It is a quite artificial uh, restriction that is used in the abstractionist debate in order to formalize at least a kind of conservativity of Hume principle. But the problem for me or for the account I propose is that uh, on an arbitrary version of Hume principle, you are unable to satisfy also this weak notion of conservativity. And so in a general naive, uh, uh, from a naive point of view, you are unable to satisfy also this weak notion of conservativity because when you are adopting an abstraction principle in an arbitrary, in an arbitrary reading, you are unable uh, to distinguish abstract and non-abstract objects. So also the restriction of the theory and the consequence to the non-abstract object is not relevant, is not uh, um, useful for you if you are adopting an arbitrary reading. I don't know if I clarified a bit. Yeah, completely, thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, so are any more questions? Yes, I do have a question. Uh, Ludovica, thanks for your presentation. Uh, you mostly spoke about arithmetic, uh, but uh, I'm quite interested in what would you say about uh, set theory? Uh, as you know, uh, sets uh, have identity criterion, which is formulated or fixed or the ident identity is fixed by the axiom of um, uh, <laughs> extensionality, uh, yeah. which fixes the in internal structure of sets. Uh, and this example may show that not all mathematical objects uh, uh, lack the internal structure. Uh, do you think that, uh, uh, well, it's still compatible with uh, structuralism, but do you think that structuralist account is uh, necessary for all mathematical objects? Okay, thanks for the, for the question. Um... It is it is quite different uh, uh, difficult to, to, to answer to all your questions because I think that I can give two, two things. Uh, your general question is that 
if in general structuralism is compatible with uh, mathematical object, for example, also in a set theoretic uh, perspective? Uh, I think yes. Uh, there are any way different way to argue for structuralism. So, uh, respect my presentation because I uh, maybe structurally, um, but uh, in the structuralist perspective, if you are a uh, supporter of a structuralist thesis, in general, not object uh, uh, characterized by their structure and not by their intrinsic nature. Um, concerning set theory, in general, I think um, axiomatic theories are uh, strongly compatible with a structuralist perspective because structuralist perspective um, admit and the indeterminacy of the nature of their so-called object precisely by uh, admitting the indeterminacy of the reference of the terms, the primitive terms that are usually considered as implicitly defined by the axioms of, the, of a theory. So for example, set theory, but also concerning arithmetic, uh, piano axiom, the the conjunction of the axiom of uh, um, Peano are usually the basis for a structuralist interpretation, so for a, for a structuralist uh, view. Uh, my, my point, my, I don't know, question, investigation is uh, if we can uh, um, follow this direction also in case of a non-axiomatic non implicit definition, like an abstraction principle. But, uh, so, in respect to your general question, I think that, uh, of course, yes, if you, if you agree with the structuralist main thesis concerning the structural uh, identification of the object and not uh, the identification of mathematical object with the intrinsic nature, you can uh, extend this uh, view to all mathematical object. And um, in the specific case of this presentation, probably I, um, I only focus to, on arithmetic uh, because uh, um, in general, Fregian programs are weaker than set theory. So, um, in, if you are interested in to the mathematical result of this uh, project, uh, you can recover some part of the set theory, but set theory is a, a really stronger theory uh, respect to abstractionist programs of this kind, of Fregian kind. So, I focus on a uh, only arithmetic because it is the philosophical and the historical uh, subject of these programs. But in general, if, the, if I understood correctly your question, I think that the structuralist perspective is, uh, uh, can be considered as a general perspective on mathematical and abstract objects. Uh, I don't know if I uh, missed some point of your question, so uh. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, so probably I'll ask a question. Uh, besides uh, the distinction between inflationary and deflationary abstractionism, in your paper you also mentioned uh, static and dynamic abstractionism. Uh, what do you think? Uh, are there any relationships between these two distinctions? Uh, uh, it is a very interesting point. I think that you can uh, um, 
consider different combination of uh, inflationary, deflationary, static and dynamic abstraction. Uh, it is not so easy to distinguish because uh, um, the only proposal of dynamic abstraction that is uh, provided by Linnebo uh, is clearly an inflationary uh, proposal. And so um, uh, in the literature, we have only an example of inflationary dynamic uh, project. Anyway, I think that in principle uh, you can also explore a kind of uh, deflationary dynamic abstraction. I think that you have uh, less motivation to pursue this direction uh, because uh, uh, deflationism, I think, uh, uh, is able to, to solve many problems that arise in the uh, static uh, context. But anyway, this is a point on which I am still uh, thinking on and uh, I am open to any suggestion if you have on this point. Okay, thank you. Sorry, um, sorry, because if, yeah. uh, sorry, because the idea is that in the dynamic abstraction, um, you have a domain that is uh, larger and larger when we add abstraction principle. So you have a, um, a semantic assumption that is radically alternative to the static one. And uh, so, sorry, I, I have interrupted you. Uh, okay, so uh, there's also a distinction between uh, two kinds of abstraction principles. Uh, the first one is two-way abstraction with an equivalence as the logical connective between left and right hand sides. And the second one is one-way abstraction with an implication. Uh, if I understand correctly, one-way abstraction tied to dynamic abstractionism, like in Einstein, Linebos, potentialism uh, account, potentialist account. So, uh, are there any objections to one-way arbitrary abstractionism and are uh, one-way abstraction principles, most notably Hume's principle, arrogant? What do you think? Okay, uh, sorry, why one-way abstractionism is arrogant? I, I missed this point, sorry. Mm, I haven't said uh, that they are necessarily arrogant, but it's a kind of uh, intuition. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I think that in the original, uh, I don't know very well Linnebo proposal, so maybe there are some points that uh, at the moment I... I don't know, but uh, uh, I think that in the literal meaning of uh, non-arrogance uh, concerning the presupposition of existence, I think that Hume principle is not arrogant, but in a static and in a dynamic perspective, because arrogance says that uh, uh, a principle is arrogant if you have to presuppose something more uh, for the truth of the statement itself. And so my question is, uh, in which sense a biconditional can be arrogant? Because the general argument for non-arrogance of Hume principle is uh, this biconditional is uh, true uh, even if uh, you mm, falsify both the side of the principle. Um, and if you want to provide the existence uh, of the, um, of, for example, of the abstract, you have to add uh, the equinumerosity or the equivalence of the concept you are considering. So I, at the moment, I didn't understand clearly why a biconditional in general is arrogant in your or in lineable perspective but probably I 
misunderstood something? Yeah, so obviously there are arguments in favor of non-arrogance of abstraction principles as equivalences, but in Linebo's conception, uh, abstraction principles are not equivalences. They are implications. It's just one oh. way implication. Okay. Okay. Because he distinguishes between an existential import and identity condition. Yeah. Is this yeah. the point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably in this, uh, in this uh, account, uh, could be interesting to evaluate the, the arrogance of the abstraction principle. Uh, I think that Linebo is less interested to uh, arrogance in general as a, a feature of abstraction. Um, but probably, as you say, at least the traditional neologicist argument failed uh, if you are considering this different uh, formulation of abstraction principle. Yeah, thanks. I, I didn't uh, consider at this point. And uh, concerning this point, uh, unfortunately for me, I think that uh, also in an arbitrary reading, you have the same problem. I don't know if you are... So some unrelated question, uh, why is Goldbach conjecture in your paper and in slides presented understood as an infinite conjunction? Why not disjunction? Okay, this is the presentation that Crispin Wright uh, give, gave in the book of 1983. Uh, Frege's conception of uh, uh, number as object um, um, and the idea is that uh, it is considered as an infinite uh, conjunction uh, because uh, probably he consider any option as a possible uh, a possible, um, I don't know, instantiation of the general uh, situation that the, the conjecture provide. And I think this is the, the reason. Um, on the other side, what I am interested in is uh, in considering the mixed identity. And I think that uh, it is quite analog and in this sense, I think that it is consider considerable as an infinite disjunction. Uh, this is my, my, my proposal because the idea is that uh, you have infinite possible uh, situation in which it is uh, true or false uh, because uh, you, have, uh, you can identify the number of F with uh, an, an infinite a candidate in an infinite range of uh, candidate denotation. So concerning the uh, identity statement, mixed identity statement, I am quite uh, safe, I think, in considering uh, it as uh, an infinite disjunction. Concerning the conjecture, uh, I think it is a way to present the same general idea, but he consider a conjunction because he consider the possible way has uh, all, the, I don't know, has uh, considering all the possible way together. Uh, I think this is the motivation. Yeah, so like an um, uh, infinite instantiation of universal quantification, right? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yes. So are there any more questions? No. I have a rather lengthy comment and would like to return to some stuff we already talked a bit uh, about last time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the 
adoption of arbitrary reference avoids some problems of both logicism and structuralism. Uh, it is mentioned in your paper. You mention uh, specifically CISO problem and the identity problem. Um, after your somewhat related talk at the last Analyticon, I asked about uh, Jeffrey Hellman's permutation objection. Uh, uh, now I'll briefly summarize the objection for those in our audience who probably forgot uh, forgot it. Uh, originally, it was uh, formulated against Stuart Shapiro's anterim structuralism, where positions can be understood as objects and structures can be understood as systems. That is, in anterim structuralism, a structure implements itself. So, non-trivial permutation of positions gives an isomorphic system, another structure. And the objection is, why should some structures be privileged over other isomorphic structures produced by permutation? I think that the proponent of arbitrary logicism could say that abstraction principles introduce terms for those positions and in such a way that one can speak of uh, one can speak of the structure of their structure that is the proponent of arbitrary logicism could provide a kind of epistemological answer to the objection and then uh, the arbitrary logicism could follow kit finds route claiming that permutations depend on the original structure, which we already uh, know thanks to the applying of abstraction principles. Uh, that is, uh, that uh, arbitrary logicism can then provide a metaphysical answer to the objection. Otherwise, the arbitrary logicism could follow Leon Horsten's route and introduce a higher order arbitrariness but honestly, I think that Horsten's approach just shifts the answer to the objection to the higher level of abstraction, where the very same objection still applies. That is, I would follow uh, Kit Fine, and I think that uh, dependency relations are the advantage of arbitrary logicism, so probably you could even add it to the list of advantages in your future paper. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> thanks, thanks. So you suggest to follow Kitfine more than Orson in this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because usually uh, uh, people consider Orson as a further development of an in initial fine suggestion. But which paper of fine you have in mind on this point of dependency? Well, there are lots of different papers by yeah. Kit Fine, and I guess uh, uh, one can start from the review of Leon Horsten's book. Mm -hmm. Where okay. he uh, shows the differences between his conception and Leon Horsten's idea. Perfect, thanks. I I didn't read this uh, review, but it could be useful for me because it is not totally clear in my presentation the relation between my arbitrariness in a semantical sense and the notion of metaphysical arbitrariness. In the last part of this slide, I try to give some uh, connection, but uh, it is a part that I would like to develop uh, further. So. Thanks for the suggestion to focus on Kit Fine and also to the comparison between Kit Fine and Leo Norson. Maybe Leo Norson is uh, more uh, sympathetic with the structuralist perspective, but it is not necessary for my account, as you mentioned at the beginning, in, in a general deflationist view. And so maybe I can consider a fine option as an independent one. So I collapsed Austin and Fine, and no, it is wrong, probably. Thanks. 
So are there any more questions? Please be brave and ask. Uh -huh. Looks like no one wants to ask. So again, thank you so much uh, for 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 your talk and presentation. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure to read your paper and grazie mille. I, I, uh, I would like sincerely to uh, thank you for this invitation. Uh, it was a, a pleasure and also an honor for me to be invited from you and to attend this uh, meeting of your seminar. And uh, also it, is, it was uh, very useful and helpful for me uh, to receive your uh, suggestion to, and your question and try to answer you. And I, uh, so thanks again to, to you, Lev, and uh, to, to the other guys. And so thank, thanks a lot for uh, this nice uh, opportunity. Okay, thank you and hope to see you soon, uh, either online or in person, who or knows? Person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Bye, bye bye. Bye, thanks again.